halfway through the day two of Data Girl. Hope you guys are all having a good time. I'm having an excellent time uh, so far. So this is desired state configuration. I'll give you a little warning. This is very PowerShell heavy. The first like 40 minutes, we'll talk about what desired state configuration is, how we would use it. Uh, there's going to be a lot of PowerShell. Then we'll talk about SQL Server with DSC. First up, uh, thank you to our sponsors. That they, this event would not be possible without them. Uh, so hopefully everyone stopped by and said hello, got some cool socks, that kind of stuff. So thank you to them. Uh, so this is me, uh, Jess Pomfret. I am a SQL Server DBA. I am based in Ohio, uh, kind of the middle of nowhere, like this. But uh, I'm originally from England, so my accent is somewhere between England and Ohio. And it's come out Australian, apparently, so <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm an open source contributor. This is really how I got started in this speaking adventure. And Chrissy back there and Rob, they are partly to blame for this. So. Uh, I've contributed to DBA tools and DBA checks, and more recently I've contributed to the SQL Server DSC module. That's actually a Microsoft uh, PowerShell module on GitHub, open source, so that's pretty cool. Uh, in my spare time when I'm not doing tech things, I do CrossFit to keep fit, and I enjoy proper football. And on this side of the Atlantic, it's actual football, but where I live, they think football is like this egg thing, and they throw it. <laughs> so, proper football. Uh, my email address and Twitter handle, if you have any questions, uh, shoot me an email, tweet at me. I'm on Twitter far too much if you ask my wife, so I'll get back to you. So the agenda for today. Uh, like I said, the first 40 minutes, we're going to talk a lot about PowerShell and about desired state configuration. We're going to talk about what it is, why we would use it, and then how we would use it. We're then going to pair that up with SQL Server. I'm a DBA by, uh, by day, so Installing SQL Server is one of those tasks that I want to automate. We'll talk about how we can use DSC to do that. So, the first concept I want to talk about is infrastructure as code. Okay, this is really the why behind why we might want to use DSC or another similar uh, tool. Desired state configuration gives us this framework to enable infrastructure as code. Now, I had a hard time getting my mind around this to begin with because I like to think of my servers as being like real computers sat somewhere that are like physical, right? But in today's more virtual uh, era, the servers are really just a document, right? We have a, a script that defines how many CPUs, how much memory, the disk layout. That is our infrastructure as code. And we want to, the main concept, if you get anything from this slide, is this source control. The idea of taking our infrastructure as code and putting it into source control that we can keep track of is the main, uh, main important thing right here. So there are many benefits for using this kind of pipeline that I have, one being security. If I have my infrastructure in source control and I use this kind of pipeline, it's going to build it, we're going to have some automated tests, and then that cute little robot is going to build my servers. I no longer need all of the permissions I had in my domain to build servers. That's good, because the robot is more reliable than me, a human. Another benefit is it's repeatable, right? If I build a server and I have this configuration that works well, I can just do the same thing over and over again. It also makes it easier to roll through environments. If I have my development configuration and it works well, I make a couple tweaks, then I put it into test. I know when I go to production, I have exactly what I need. Uh, so it makes it repeatable. There's no surprises when we get to prod and I forgot to do one switch or one checkbox. So this is kind of a culture thing, right? We can't get excited about DSC today and then go in on Monday and be like, guys, we're doing infrastructure as code. Everything is going to be in source control. We need to like take a small piece. And so a good way of getting started is to have like a POC, a proof of concept, some kind of small project where we can use infrastructure as code and then show the benefits. Once you can show the benefits, you can kind of expand on that, right? So desired state configuration. It was first released in Windows Management Framework 4.0 and was greatly enhanced with 5.1. So if you are on an older server using 4.0, I'd recommend upgrading them. Now it is PowerShell, but it is a domain-specific language. And what that means is it looks like PowerShell, but it has its own domain of terms and, uh, and patterns right? that is used within the, within the language. Once we get a handle on that language, we're going to write configurations, and those will manage the desired state of our infrastructure. It's also based on industry standards. These two uh, bullet points at the bottom enable us to plug into other third-party tools, uh, which is 
one of the downsides of DSC is the reporting and troubleshooting. Using other tools to plug in, you can uh, improve on some of that. So DSC stages. There are really four stages I want to talk about, and this is kind of how my presentation is going to flow. We're first going to have to write our configuration. What is our desired state? What do we want it to look like? Once we have that document, we'll push it out to our target nodes, and then it will be enacted, or the make it so phase. Once we have our servers in desired state, we'll then monitor them. Uh, we'll look for any configuration drift. Is it still how we wanted it to be configured, or has anything changed? Now, the monitoring I won't talk about too much. Uh, I have a demo at the end, uh, but as I mentioned, the monitoring and troubleshooting of DSC is definitely kind of the weakest point. Uh, it is still a relatively new technology, and it is always changing, so hopefully that piece will improve. Make sense so far? All right, so step one, we're going to author our configuration. The first thing we want to think about is that DSC is a declarative language. Now, usually when we write, when we write PowerShell, it's imperative, right? I'm going to say exactly how to do your job. I want a new item. I want it at this path, and I want it to be a directory. I'm telling you exactly how to do it, whereas in the declarative block at the bottom, which is a DSC resource, I'm just telling you what I would like. I don't care how you do it. However you want to make it, make it work, but I want there to be a directory present at that location. So with that declarative uh, language, you kind of get away from having to roll your own error log or error handling and, uh, and logging and such. Everything is kind of included with DSC. So if I run that first script, it'll create a directory. Everyone's happy. If I run that first script again, we're going to see a sea of red. I can't create the directory. It's already there. With the second piece, with the DSC, I run it once, it'll create the directory. When I run it again, I'll say, we're in the desired state, we're good, no changes needed. And that brings me on to my second uh, concept. Now, it's always a really good idea to put a word that's super hard to say in a presentation. <laughs> so here it is. DSC is item potent, which means that we can apply that same configuration over and over again and not have any, we won't get away from our desired state. It means we can make incremental changes and we'll just add the changes that we need. So if I had one directory and I wanted to add a second one, I'd, add, I'd have the two directory blocks still, but when I pushed it out, I would only create that new directory that we needed. So resources. These are really the building blocks of DSC. Now when we talk about desired state, we can think about all of the different things we can configure, files, services, etc. Those come as resources. And they're packaged up as PowerShell modules. Let's see if we can get over here. <coughs> All right. So whenever we have a Windows Management Framework on our server, we come with PS Desired State Configuration Module. And these are some built-in resources that are available to us right out of the box. If I can scroll, you can see the file one that I've been talking about so far. Uh, the file uh, resource is built in. It's available on all nodes that have that uh, WMF version. Uh, so it can be used straight away. There's also service, registry, all kind of resources built in. With PowerShell, it likes to teach you as it goes, right? We have that get dash command in PowerShell so we can find a command we need. And then we have get dash help to like learn how to use it, right? It gives us a description. It gives us examples. With uh, DSC, we have get DSC resource. We can give it that name of file and then ask for the syntax. And it returns exactly what we need to just copy and paste and put into our configuration document. So you can see that I'm going to say it's a file resource. I'm going to give it a resource name. That has to be unique within your configuration. But it can be whatever you like. Then these are the properties we have available for us to configure that file. So a destination path. Uh, the bottom, you can see, I can say it's a type of directory or file. If it is a file, there's a contents property that I can inject uh, contents into that file on my target node perhaps a configuration document or something. But the PowerShell wants you to be able to use this stuff, so it, it makes it as easy as possible. So if I come on down. As I said, they're uh, implemented as modules. So if I look for a little more information about this uh, service resource, you can see there's a path that's just a PSM1 file. And if I open that in code, get rid of this a sec. 
There's some more stuff at the top to do, to do with localization and language and stuff, but you can see there are really three functions that make up any resource. There's get target resource, which does exactly that. It gets it. There's test target resource, which will return true or false. Am I, is that resource in the desired state? And then there's set target resource, which will fire if it's not in the desired state. So any resource that you, that you use will have the same format. Now, hopefully, the internet is going to play nice. And hopefully, code is going to play nice. Now, there's obviously only so many that are available in that built-in module. But the gallery has thousands of more resources that are packaged up as these modules that you can go and find, right? So I know there's one called SQL Setup, but if I'm looking for a resource, I can use Find DSC Resource to search the PowerShell gallery for that. I don't think it's going to come back, but believe me, it's out there. All right. So some more on resources. This first box is the ones that were built in, right? We have general stuff, files, services, Windows features. The second one is the SQL Server DSC module. That's what we know we're going to need to install and configure our SQL Server. There are things relating to availability groups. That first one, SQL AG. There is SQL databases. There is SQL Server, Server memory, SQL setup. There's SQL agent operator, which no one really cares about apart from me. I needed that resource, so I wrote it, and now it's part of the module, which is super cool. Uh, there's also X Active Directory. Now, that's still a official Microsoft module of resources, but it's experimental. It doesn't meet the highly qualified needs or the highly qualified requirements to be named like SQL Server, so it has the X. It's still okay. You can still use it, just a little more testing. Some things could change as we go. Uh, when I did a count on the number of resources available in the gallery, I did this yesterday, there are now 1,500 different resources, different things that you can configure across your infrastructure. The SQL Server module has 34 so far. All right, so we know about our resources. Anyone have questions about that? Okay. We're going to talk about our first configuration document. Now, this is the document we're going to create to define our desired state. So first of all, we have configuration, and I've named it create SQL folders. This is a special type of PowerShell function. Remember, I mentioned that domain-specific language, uh, and, and I just have given it a name. Within that, I can then import the resources I want to use. This is a keyword, import DSC resources, can only be used within your configuration block, and it just brings in any resources you might need. Within that, we have the node block. Now, you can have more, one or more node blocks within your document, and you can specify one or more servers within each node block. This is just a real simple example. I've hard-coded server one, but I could also uh, pass in an array of servers. Within that, we then put our resources, right? This is the file resource we've been seeing. Uh, we've named it create data dirt. As I mentioned, that needs to be unique within your configuration document. And then within that, we define the properties. Uh, the destination path, we want it to be present, and it is of type directory. Now, obviously, this is a really simple example. In a real example, we would have many resources right, within that one document to define everything about that server. OK. So now we've got our configuration. It's kind of in that human-readable format. It needs to be compiled into a MOF file. The MOF file is what is actually sent out to the target node uh, and is compiled by running that configuration. Now, I put one MOF per node, which is kind of true. There is something called partial configurations, and the internet seems to suggest that it is more trouble than it's worth. Yeah. It, it seems like a super cool idea because you could have like your Windows team push out a server configuration, and then your DBA push out a deep, uh, like a SQL Server install configuration, and they will merge together and live happily. But it seems that they don't always go like that. So let's do one MOF per node, and then we can be, we can modify them and reapply them. Right? That item potent idea. We're going to make incremental changes and then push them out. Let's do it. Let's make them off. So we need to restart the session. Say that again. Exactly that. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's my uh, simple configuration. 
<clears throat> I just restarted this thing because so I don't know what it's doing. Uh, but I've named it Create SQL Folders. I'm use, pulling in my PS desi desired state configuration resources, and then I'm pushing against two nodes, okay? Uh, these are both just little VMs running on my laptop. I'm creating a couple of uh, data directories, all real simple. So when I run that, nothing really happens, right? It's come back and nothing's, nothing's really executed except it's created that configuration, which as I mentioned, is a, uh, an actual type of command. You can see that right here. So then to, to create the mock files, you execute that command, right? or that configuration. So the create SQL folder, I'm just giving it an output file. I guess I should open this. And you can see that it's created two MOFs, and they're named server.mof. Uh, I'm in a certain type of mode right now, so that is the naming. If I was going to do a pool server, which is more complicated, we'll talk about that in a minute, it will be named with a GUID. Okay. So within the MOF file, and you can edit these if you like, but they're kind of ugly. So it's, it's recommended you, you don't do that. But this is where the third party tools can kind of plug in. But you can see, you can still kind of read what's going on, right? We're creating a couple of directories within the MOF file. So I'm just going to get rid of those so they don't get in the way. All right. So that was a really simple configuration, right? In the real world, we need to do more complicated things. And the next step is to talk about configuration data. And the idea here is we separate the data, the hard-coded values, away from the configuration. So I'm then going to be able to use that configuration data within the configuration document. I know, how many times can I say configuration on one slide? <laughs> um, this means that I can use that same configuration for multiple environments but change it slightly to behave differently per environment, right? And this configuration data is stored as a, as a hash table. It must have an all nodes key, but then you can also have non-node data. Uh, the all nodes key uh, lists your nodes either an asterisk for all of them or one by one to data that only affects that certain, node, that certain server name. So let's go ahead and look at that configuration we had and pull out that data and make it a little more flexible. That. So, here's my configuration. It's the same one as before, but I've just pulled out uh, the node names and the directory names. Uh, I'm using that all node special variable that is available because I use configuration data, and then node names. So any node uh, will have a node block. Within that, you can see my resources for my files. I'm using configuration data, non-node data, data directory, and log directory. Right? I'm just going to pull those values out of the configuration file and use them here. If I scroll down a little more, you can see that I'm using some PowerShell stuff with it, right? I'm saying that for the last uh, node block, I'm saying all nodes where their environment is test. I'm going to create a test directory on those, but I don't want it on production, right? So this is how you can kind of uh, control your configuration based on environment without having to really change the configuration document. So let's run this. And you can see I've created one node. It would probably be cool to see the configuration data. Okay, so this is my configuration data that I passed in into that configuration data parameter. And you can see I've defined one server, it's a test server, and then those are my three directory names that I'm going to use, right? So when I ran that configuration, I got this DSC server onemoff And if I open that and look at the file, you can see I've created the data directory, I've created the log directory, and then I've created a test directory, right? Because I defined it as a test, as a test server, and because of that, my configuration added this in. All right, we've done our testing. We're happy with that. Let's go to production. So I'm going to create another server. I'm going to create DSC server 2. We're going to production. That's all I need to do to add in another server, right? And because it's part of my configuration data, I'm just going to re-execute my create SQL folder configuration. I don't need to recompile that. But if I pass in the configuration data, I now have two MOF files because I added that second server. And if you remember, it's going to be different because it's a production server. I now only have file create, create data directory and then file create log directory. There's no test directory, right? I've moved to production. I dropped that off. So that's, what, that's just how we can kind of control that configuration. Make sense? All still awake? 
Some have beer, some are happy. Cool. All right, so once we've authored our document and we've created our configuration data, and those things have been checked into source control, right? Everything's under source control. We're keeping track of versions, changes, etc. We're going to go ahead and publish. Now, with DSC, we have two modes that we can run in. We can run in the push mode, which is the simplest. It's what I'm going to show you today. I'm going to uh, actively apply the configuration I'm writing to a node and then start it. Uh, it's the default mode, and it's the easiest mode for playing around. If you're going to move this to production, you might want to look at the pull mode, which is where you have a pull server either on-prem with the services set up or uh, you're using Azure Automation uh, to register your nodes to the pull server. And then the pull server contains all of the configurations and all of the modules you might need. And those will be automatically pulled down uh, based on this refresh frequency minute setting. So that's how often it checks in, sees if there's a configuration, and pulls it down. So to deliver the configuration to the node, we can, we'll write it, we'll compile it to a MOF file, and then we'll use the start DSC configuration command, uh, giving it the output path and the, the computer I want to affect. Uh, this one will push it out and it, it make it so immediately, right? As soon as that MOF file gets to the target node, it is going to happen. So on this example, I'm using the weight parameter and the verbose par parameter. Uh, that means that it'll run in the foreground, and I'll see the output. If you just run that without it, it'll go into like a PowerShell job, and it'll be in the background, and you'll have to retrieve it. The other option we have is published DSC configuration. That'll do the same. It'll deliver the configuration to the node, but it won't enact it immediately. Uh, we'll talk about how they get enacted in a minute, but uh, basically what'll happen is it'll sit there in the pending state until the timer... Uh, is met for when it should be applied, and then it'll be applied on that time frame. If you're going to use the push uh, method, you might as well do start DSC configuration because you're kind of controlling it anyway. Uh, but this, will, this is a way to publish out configurations and not apply them immediately. All right. So our MOF files are on our target node. They get called pending in a certain folder uh, on your C drive. It's time to enact them. This is where the magic happens. This is The local configuration manager is like your DSC engine, and it runs on every target node. And its main job is to pass those MOF files and then make it so. Uh, the configuration manager has a bunch of settings we'll see in a minute, but that's how you de defer determine whether you're in push or pull mode, and then any other settings you might want to set. So these are just a few of the settings you can apply uh, that you can configure on your LCM. Action after reboot. Well, after it's rebooted, should it continue applying that configuration or should it stop and wait? Uh, reboot node if needed. That's super cool unless you're in production and you maybe don't want that on anymore. But <laughs> basically, if you push out a configuration that does something like install Windows services, something that might require a reboot. If there's a pending reboot, it will reboot. And then depending on your action after reboot, will continue or pause. Uh, the refresh mode was push versus pull. What else do we have? Uh, the certificate ID. That's really important when you're going to talk about encrypting your MOF files. That certificate ID is the certificate you use to encrypt it, and then you tell the local configuration manager about it so that it can decrypt it and use it. Configuration mode is the last one I'm going to talk about. Uh, the default is apply and monitor, so it applies the configuration, and then it kind of keeps track of any changes that happen. You can also set that to apply and autocorrect, so if I say create two directories and then I come along with my day job and I just delete one, the LCM will be like, oh, well, I'm not in the desired state and it'll put it back. But that's fine, but I work with a lot of vendor software and if they install something and set a bunch of settings and I set them back, they're not going to be super happy with me. All right, so let's configure our LCM. So to configure our LCM, we're going we're gonna to use something called a meta configuration. Oh, let's, let's take a look first. Sorry. Got excited. So these are all the settings available on that LCM. You can see there's a lot of them. We're going to focus on just a couple. So I'm going to select the action after reboot, the refresh mode, and the configuration mode frequency, which is every 15 minutes. If I want to change those, I'm going to write a meta configuration 
which looks a lot like the configurations we've already created, right? Configuration, a name, the node to effect, and then this settings block. So I'm going to just change this configuration mode frequency set, uh, minutes to 20. Someone asked the last time I gave this session why I included the other two properties, and it's just to show that that's how you change multiple ones. I'm only changing one, so really I only need that in my configuration. So I'll run this configuration. And then I'll invoke it to get a meta MOF file. You can see that it has server name.meta.mof, which means that it is the MOF file for the LCM for that server. And then to apply it, I'll use set DSC local configuration manager, pushing it to that path and the computer name. I use verbose, so it's, it's just telling you what it's done. It's finished, and I can check the settings. And you can see that I updated that to 20 minutes. So that metamorph file now lives out on that node, and it will keep it up, and it will be in that desired state. Depending on the settings, it may keep it that way or not. OK, so that was configuring our LCM, which is like our DSC engine. The next phase, so now we're, we're, we're in our desired state, right? We've pushed out our configuration. Uh, it's been enacted, enacted by the LCM, and it's time to monitor. I'm going to talk about this real quickly. I'm then going to do my SQL Server piece, and then we'll do the monitoring after we've actually made uh, the, the server into the desired state, because it's a little easier to see. So these are a couple of uh, commandlets that we have available to us to keep an eye on our configurations. The first one will get the current configuration of your nodes. It's not necessarily going to tell you whether it's in the desired state or not. It's just going to tell you what the current configuration is. The second one, get configuration, DSC configuration status, uh, will get the status for the completed runs. So was it successful? Did it fail? How many resources did it use? That kind of stuff. Finally, we have test DSC configuration. If you use verbose, it'll give you that same kind of DSC output, that yellow resource name, any verbose messages, uh, and then tell you whether it's in the desired state with true or false if it's not in the desired state. If you use the detail switch, you'll get more information returned as a PowerShell object, and that's easier to use. The other option for troubleshooting and debugging DSC is the event logs. This is the path for where you can find them on your target node. Uh, the first two, operational and admin, are enabled by default. The last two, uh, you can turn on if you need, then rerun your configuration and get some more details. I will say that troubleshooting DSC and this monitoring piece is definitely what's lacking in the technology right now. Uh, if something goes wrong, it's often hard to decide what went wrong. And so these event logs will really help you with that. Cool. So that is the whistle stop tour of DSC. Anyone have any questions? Is everyone still awake? Good? OK, sure. I just have a question. I missed what, what does MOF stand for? Uh, management Object Format. It's uh, uh, industry standard format that that file ends up. Oh, OK. So. You have a question, Rob? Or are you just waving? No, I was waving. Oh, OK, <laughs> cool. All right, so I'm a DBA. The company I work at, we have a lot of small uh, third-party tools that run on SQL Server, right? So I get asked all the time, hey, can you build me a SQL Server yesterday? So this is, uh, this is the checklist that I will go through when someone asks me that, right? I'm going to install Windows features if I need them. If I'm running an older version, I might need .NET, uh, .NET Framework. I'm going to create my directories. I'm going to install my SQL Server. I'm going to enable TCP IP and my Windows Firewall so I can connect remotely. And then I have some server configuration options. Uh, I want to set backup compression on, uh, my cost threshold for parallelism, and max up. I'm then going to create my DBA database so I can put my old uh, scripts in for maintenance. This is kind of my checklist, right? Now, this isn't going to be how you should configure your SQL Server. This is just an example on how you can configure it. This is not necessarily best practices. So I'm taking this checklist, and I'm going to translate it into the, the resources I'm going to use for DSC. Now, we do have some uh, options available. For uh, the .NET Framework piece, I can use the built-in Windows feature. I can use the built-in file to create my directories. And then I can use the SQL Server DSC module for some of the more SQL Server stuff. Installing SQL Server, the TCP IP firewall stuff, there's all resources available for that. 
I will mention on the firewall, you can see that I have two options. The SQL Server DSC module has a resource that is specifically for opening the firewall for SQL Server. You don't have to think about it. You just say, I've installed the SQL engine, and then it opens the, uh, the port you need for that. If you want to be a little more specific about it, you want to name it a certain way, you can use the networking DSC module. They have a firewall resource that you can control anything you could, anything you could control through the um, advanced firewall GUI. Finally, I have my SQL Server configuration and SQL database. Make sense? Let's do it. Let's install and configure a SQL Server. Live. All right. So I'm going to kick this off because it takes a couple minutes. And it is going to ask for a password, and I'm going to give it a super safe one. SA password, right? All right, so this is off and running. It's going through my configuration and making my target node, which is DSC Server 2, just another VM on my laptop, uh, to my desired state. You can see it's already made it to the install SQL piece. Uh, so we'll just minimize that while it gets to that. All right, let's look at the moth file. So this moth file is similar to what we saw before. We're going to see all of the resources we did. There's my install directory. The reason I want to show you this is this. There's my super safe password, right? It's not super safe. It's in plain text. Now, I had to jump through a hoop to do this. Uh, DSC will not let you do this automatically. It'll say, whoa, your password is going to be in plain text. But I said, it's cool. I got this. Let me do it. Um, you need to encrypt your MOF files, right? You need to have a certificate that you can encrypt your MOF file. You tell your LCM on your target node about it, and then that password is no longer plain text. Uh, it's just for playing around on your own demo machines. I mean, you can do this, right? You can tell DSC not to panic. It's under control. But for production or for real world examples, you need to take care of that. Oh, man, where'd it go? All right, let's take a look at our configuration file, too. All right, so I've got two nodes to find. I've got my test node and my production node. I'm only pushing it out to the DSC server 2 right now. I specified that in my start DSC configuration call. Uh, I also have this node name as asterisk, which means that applies to all nodes. And you can see that's the hoop I had to jump through. I had to say plain text passwords are OK. Uh, usually, that wouldn't be there, and it would, it would not let you go any further. Then I have my non-node data. Now, there are a couple of ways you can set this up, right? And it's kind of on preference or how you're going to use it. You can see from my directories, I've just listed them right under non-node data. So now I'm going to get to them by doing configuration data, non-node data, data directory. The other way for my config options is I've nested a hash table under it. And now I'm going to use PowerShell kind of functions to be able to loop through that and create resources based off that. So that gives you a little more fl flexibility on how you can change my SQL Server setup without having to change the configuration document, right? So there are my config options. That's the extent of my config file. I have a question. Sure. Is there any possibility to add some uh, dynamic part to that? Because if, if I have a max degree of fabulous in my, on the test, I want four, on the production, I want eight. Sure. Yeah, you could do that. And uh, you could either do it by having, uh, I believe you can do like an environment and then have test and then nest the features you wanted under that, right? So you could get through and use PowerShell to say uh, server name and then environment test and then get that data. So yeah, you can, you can use PowerShell kind of functions and methods to, use, to bring in that dynamic stuff. Yeah, good question. All right, so finally, this is my configuration file, right? The last piece of what, we've, uh, what we're installing. Uh, I've named it Install SQL Server. I've pulled in my modules. And then I'm just going to loop through my nodes, my all nodes node name. I've commented out uh, .NET because it just adds a little time, and I don't need it for SQL Service 2017. Uh, you can see my install directory. I'm just pulling them from the non-node data. So those can be changed without touching this document. There is my install SQL. There are a lot, more feature, uh, a lot more properties available, but this is just to get a basic install. I'm using the security mode of SQL, which is mixed mode authentication. Uh, and I'm making me a sysadmin. There's the enable TCP IP and the firewall rule. And then here is my uh, 
SQL Server configuration options. Now, I, know, I mentioned that I put that in a different uh, format in my configuration file, and that gives me the ability to use the for each method to loop through that and create the resources on the fly, right? So if I added a configuration option, I would get four configuration options resources instead of just three. Uh, so finally, I have my install database or my create database. You'll notice that some of my uh, resources I'm using that depends on. In WMF 4.0, uh, DSC just ran resources how it felt like it. Now it runs them from top to bottom, which is better. But if my install fails, I don't want it to try and create a database because you can't create a database if your instance doesn't exist, right? So that depends on will not run if that has not reached the desired state. You can also use PSDSC run as credential, which I'm highlighting at the bottom, on all of your uh, resources. So by default, it runs as a system account. If I use that, I can pass in my AD account, my Windows credentials, and it'll run under me, which will give me access to file shares, uh, local user, registry keys, that kind of stuff that it wouldn't have. All right, so the good news, we installed a SQL server in three minutes and 10 seconds, which is pretty good. So if I come over to Azure Data Studio and connect to this guy, and under databases, you can see my DBA database. So I have my instance stood up. I have my database created. Let's check my, uh, oh no. Anyone? There we go. All right, so I am connected to that DSC Server 2 instance that we just built. And if I show advanced options, and then just looking at my cost threshold for parallelism, you can see it's set at 25. Cool, so I have my server configured. It's set up exactly how I want it in like four minutes, right? It's not as fast as those containers we saw in the last session, but it's pretty fast. It's pretty good for automating an install. Okay, so when, what do I do if I want to change that, right? We talked about how we make these incremental changes. So let's go ahead. I'm going to create you guys a nice database. You guys have been very kind. So let's just copy that. And I'm going to create a Grillin database to hold sausages. <laughs> I wish, right? OK, so I've just added a resource. Now, because of how I have it set up, I had to do that to the configuration file, right? Or, yeah, the configuration document. Depending on how I did it, I could have a list of databases and settings in my configuration file, right, and have loops through them and avoid having to make this change. But the other place to make changes would be in my configuration data. Now, I was doing some reading at lunch and I read on the internet, everything you read on the internet is true, right? It's a really good idea to set this value to 500. So I'm going to do that. Um, spoiler alert, that is not a good idea. Do not do that. But for this demo, we're living on the edge. OK, so I've changed my configuration data, and I've added another database. So I'm just going to run this whole thing. It's going to ask for my password again because of how I have it set up. And it is going to run through. It's running through everything right now and testing it, right? Is SQL installed? Are these folders there? Et cetera, et cetera. And in eight seconds, it's come back, and it's now in the desired state. You can see right here, this is. This is kind of the output you get from, from that verbose switch, okay? So here you can see it's getting the SQL databases, and it says a SQL database named DBA is present, right? That was the check, and it said, all right, that one's good. Then it got to the Gorillan database, and it said it's absent. It, and ensure is set to present, so it should be created. So it then runs the set piece, and it creates that database. It will also have checked those configuration settings and noticed that they didn't match and updated those. So let's refresh my database list. There's my Grillin database. Woo! And my cost threshold for parallelism is set at this super optimal number. Don't go do this, okay? If you learn anything, don't, don't do that. It's okay. All right. So that was installing our SQL Server with DSC. Make sense? Yeah. Yep. They need to be installed on the target box first. Great right. shout. Yeah. So the resources need to be available to both your authoring station and your target node. What's your, have you got any recommendations about making, how to make sure those modules are present in the targets? Is that part of the base build or is there another method? Yeah. So uh, in this example, I just pushed them out because it's just a demo example. 
in my real life work, we're using this to install SQL servers right now, and we have a file share that's available to both, uh, both nodes or all nodes on our network where our PowerShell modules live. Uh, and so those are added as DSC resources. Uh, they have to be zipped and you add a checksum. But there is a really great blog post on how to set up a file share and you just tell your LCM where that file share is. So then it pulls them in. But if you were using like a pool server or something like that, your modules would be on your pool server and then the node would check in and pull them down. Yep. And Azure Automation, the other option, also handles modules in the cloud for you. So. But yes, the modules with the resources have to be available on both. Yes? Could you um, get you know, different versions of those modules in at the same place and reference the performance? Yes, you, there's a, uh, at the top where I pulled them in, I could just say module version and then give it the version. And as long as it was available in both spots, both on my authoring and on my target node, it would use that version. If you have multiple versions available and you don't specify, it will say it doesn't know which one to pick and it will stop. So. Oh, so it won't automatically use the latest? No, it won't. It will say, I don't know what to do, which is like, yeah, I, I don't know. But, I mean, potentially you could do some kind of PowerShell, right, to say what's the latest one, pull that one in. But uh, yeah, by default it seems to choke on that. So. All right. Cool. So I got one more thing to add to my SQL Server. One of the most uh, one of the things that adds the most flexibility to DSC is if there is not a resource available, you have some options on how to get around that. So first of all, there is a script resource which I'm showing right here, uh, and I'm going to set SQL max memory using this. So this script resource has uh, a get script, a test script, and a set script, which if you remember is very similar to how our modules and our resources looked before. Um, so with that, you can write any PowerShell that you can do a test, a get, and a set, and kind of in, embed it as your own resource, right? Like a real kind of um, quick method to get around it. The other method is you write your own resource, right? If you have stuff that you do at your company, uh, on a regular basis, you could write a internal module of resources and publish that to your target and authoring nodes and then use them. Uh, but this script, I'm using DBA tools to uh, set my max memory. The get script needs to return result and the value. Uh, so I'm just doing get DBA max memory, uh, passing in the, the local computer name, because remember this is going to run on the target node, and then getting the max value. Uh, my test script will return true or false if the max value matches the recommended value, return true, otherwise don't. And then finally, my set script, that will set my max memory to the recommended level uh, if it's not there, right? And that set will only fire if my test returns false. Uh, so I don't have to do any error handling. I know that's not going to run if it doesn't need to. So if I execute this, add in that password again. Now it's not actually using that password, I just had a get credential to, to put it in, which is why it's popping up. But you can see now it's using uh, that SQL max memory and it's using the test piece, right? It's going to test and see if my target node is using the recommended amount of max server memory. And if it's not, it will run the set piece. Yes. Yes. Uh, no, so the, the aim is to run the whole thing again because we're going to make one MOF file which has our desired state and then it will test everything and only do the things that aren't in the desired state. So if we ran like a small configuration, the desired state is now only that piece. Yeah. So that if we were going to monitor or check in on whether we're still in the configuration, we would now only have one resource uh, within our configuration, if that makes sense. Okay. Sure. Good question, because now it finished. Uh, so you can see that the test came back and it said it is not set to the recommended value. It's currently not set, right? That's the max value. And then because test returned false, it performed the set operation to set my max memory. Um, I believe there is a SQL max memory resource in the SQL Server DSC, but I just wanted to kind of show. Now I'm using our community DBA tools. Uh, within DSC, now D DBA tools needs to be on the target node also or available, right? So it can it can call those. 
uh, commands. But that's adding the script resource. And that's a really nice way of adding in things you don't have resources for. There is also a SQL script resource. Same deal, but T-SQL. All right. So let me show you the monitoring piece we talked about a little earlier. So I'm going to do get DSC configuration. And you can see uh, this returned, oh, it's not returned, there we go. This has returned our current configuration, the configuration I pushed out, right? There's my SQL max memory, there's my database. Uh, I pushed out the DBA, I didn't have the Grillin in the second uh, uh, script I ran. So there's my DBA database, there's my SQL max memory. It's just telling me the current configuration. So if I remove this database, this DBA database, come on. Okay. So I dropped that database. If I now look at the current configuration, and I've just filtered it to where it's uh, SQL database, create DBA database, you can see that the current configuration is now that it's absent. It doesn't tell you that it should be present, it's just telling you that it's not there. So this is not super useful if we wanna know whether we're in the desired state or not. The next option we have is this get DSC configuration status. Uh, and this is telling us the status of our run, status of our runs. So you can see the last one was successful, I had 12 resources, so if I ran just a snippet, I'd only have one resource, right? Uh, but you can see the mode that was used, and there's more information past this uh, if you select certain columns. For example, you can, oh, you can select the uh, resources that are in the desired state or not in the desired state. And for some reason, occasionally this works, and occasionally it doesn't. But this is telling me that all of my resources are in the desired state, and that none are not in the desired state, which we know isn't true because that database was dropped. So this is really good if you want to see like your job runs, whether they were successful, what resources were pushed out. But if you want to see if it's in the desired state, I'd recommend using this test DSC configuration. And if you run it just as it is, it's super useful. Man, someone downloaded some, my uh, computer or something is running slowly. Okay. Does anyone, okay, there we go. So it's super useful, it says no, I'm not in the desired state, but it doesn't tell you why or what you should do about it, right? It just returns false. So you can use the verbose switch, and that's gonna run through and show you the output as you would see if you ran uh, your DSC configuration. And you can see here it says the SQL database name DBA is absent, uh, and it's the insurer is set to, to present, so it should be created and that it's false. And then when it gets to the end here, it will still return false. But, but if you read through all of that verbose output, you could tell why. The better option is to use the detailed parameter. And I'm just selecting the resources not in the desired state, but that gives you a lot more information on what is in the desired state and what is not in the desired state. Maybe. All right, there we go. So you can see that my create DBA database is, not, is a resource that is not in the desired state. Depending on how I have my LCM set up, I could have it that it will automatically put it back, which as I mentioned earlier is cool, but I can't really see a reason to use that in production, maybe in like a test environment, but it's a little scary. Anyone have questions on checking our status and our resources and stuff? Cool. Yeah. Yeah, it just ignores them. Okay. Yeah, so that's one thing that's kind of interesting, right? Because my desired state is to only have these two databases. But if I added another one, it won't check and see whether there's additional stuff. So if there's something I care about, it should be in my configuration uh, so that it's tested, right? So like, even I'm thinking about like settings that are set to the default, but I want them to stay at the default. I'm gonna add them to my configuration so that if someone changes them away from the default, it's like, oh, now I'm not in the desired state, right? Which is true, it's, and I have one kind of point for that in a second, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting, like, how much do you put in there, like, what do you really care about? 
Okay. All right. So now you're all super excited about DSC. This was a super fast talk. I must have talked really fast or I missed a whole chunk we don't know about. It's a surprise. Uh, but it, the next steps are, and the first one is that source control piece, right? Those artifacts that we created, our configuration documents and our configuration data, we want to check those into source control and keep track of them. Now, yeah. The password stuff. Yeah. How would you handle that in source control with config data and such like? Um, the password as in the SA credential? Yeah. So if I encrypt it, I wouldn't put my MOF file into uh, source control, and, but I would encrypt my MOF file so it wouldn't be plain text. Um, so the password stuff, I'd probably keep that separate, uh, and I'd inject it somehow, like maybe use Azure Key Vault or some kind of local so Word document on my, uh, on my desktop. So just use it in, so when you would check and public stuff like that as part of the pipeline. Yeah, so those are like the next it. steps, right? You okay. could use that tied into DSC. Uh, and a lot of those tools have DSC resources or ways to use DSC resources within them that kind of makes the management easier. I would definitely say that the DSC, uh, like this use case is super useful. Like I use this at work to install servers, but I don't have anything reporting or monitoring them. Like I just want to be able to stand them up to my standards before I hand them over. So, so you just, you put it in a, in a sort of at runtime, you put the SA credentials in sort of Right, yeah, so okay. you could either do that or you could do it like in DevOps, maybe you could have some kind of secret button. And you, because you want, in that scenario, you want to make more things you're doing already. Right. So you always your DevOps for your whatever Yeah, so my, my kind of vision is, is yeah, you have like the config file with the data. Maybe I change some of it, maybe I wouldn't, but I add in my server name and I say <coughs> I want to build, and then the pipeline would kind of take care of the rest. But that's definitely kind of next steps, and I'm apparently right for it. Thank you. Sure. Um, so yeah, the source control is a really big thing, right? It it adds in this like auditing trail basically of any changes that are made. I now have when they happened, who did it, hopefully why. Hopefully I didn't just write stuff or worked like fix stuff. It's my commit message. But if I put a useful commit message, I can now see all of the history on that server, right? Why did I change? Uh, the cost threshold to 500. I, I read an internet post and I just did it at one o'clock at this day, right? You can go back and be like, I started having performance problems, like what happened right then? And you can pinpoint it. So the next step after that is the CI pipeline idea, right? How do I automate that further? Do I have like a form somewhere that someone fills in and says I need a server and then I approve it and then it basically gets built? Uh, all of that secret stuff is built into that. Um, the, the middle section are third party tools that all kind of plug and play with this kind of idea, right? Um, the reporting on those, like if you look at Puppet, some of the reporting that you can do to see whether it's still in the desired state is really nice. But obviously some of those you're going to pay money for. Whereas DSC you can get uh, set up and go in pretty quickly. Uh, the last three I've got on here are like topics that are pretty interesting and you could uh, kind of delve into if you've done this and you want more. So the Datum, uh, Datum is a PowerShell module that kind of uh, adds in hierarchies, hierarchies for your configuration data. So I could have a configuration data file for a Windows server, and then it's of type SQL server, so I could add in some more configuration for that. And then it's an environment, right? Like dev test prod, these things are different. And so Datum takes all of those documents and compiles them together and then creates the configuration data for your configuration document. So that's a really cool uh, way of splitting up that configuration data even more because otherwise you're gonna end up with a really big configuration document, right? Or configuration data document. The last one is reverse DSC. Now this is, uh, it was used for SharePoint migrations to begin with and the SQL Server stuff is still kind of new and kind of half-baked. Uh, but it's the idea is you point it at a current server and then you pull down what the configuration document would look like, right? Like how is it set up now? And it creates, it like reverse engineers it basically. So you can then start putting it in source control or starting to use DSC. Um, the Azure automation piece is a, a pull server option where you can register your on-prem nodes or your AWS nodes or your Azure nodes with this pool server and it takes care of the modules and the configuration and everything for you. 
uh, as far as where it is. All right. Does anyone have any questions right now? Sure. Uh, do we know any possibility of interact like VMware or, or NetApp stores to like inject the configuration? Yeah. yeah. So there is a way that you can build a VM and have that configuration file like injected. Uh, so the file, basically, that moth file sits in a directory and it's named like current.moth if it's the current configuration or pending.moth if it hasn't been enacted yet. So you can inject that file as pending.moth and then when the VM comes up, the LCM, uh, I, I think it'll check, like, it automatically has like 15 minutes or 20 minutes. It'll check in and be like, oh, a configuration, and then it'll do it. So yeah, you can do that. Sure. Anyone else? <coughs> yeah. If you're here with it, for the first time and what is that you see to see whether something that might work in your company, what kind of resources would you use to learn how to just get going on a very basic level? Sure. Um, so, so <coughs> your big question, yeah. Sure, sorry. Uh, the question was you're interested and you how do you go about getting more information to start using it in your company and setting up a POC? Uh, so the first thing I would say I have a few blog posts out there with like some of the pieces uh, that we talked about today. There is some good documentation on the Microsoft uh, Books Online for that. And uh, there are some good like uh, PowerShell conference, I think they were, videos. Like, is it PSConf or uh, Summit? PowerShell Summit and uh, PSConf. Yeah, yeah. They, all their videos are online on yeah. YouTube. So if you search YouTube for design state configuration, there's a bunch of really good ones. Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah, Gail or something. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's the guy that did the data.
really fast because we're done super early. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, the good news is I think there's beer at the next session, so maybe you guys can get in line for that. Uh, but if you have any questions, uh, like I said, I'm on Twitter way too much, so tweet at me, my website, my email address. Let me know what you need. The feedback is not optional. Uh, this is the session feedback for day two. I'm still relatively new. I only started doing uh, public speaking like a year ago. Uh, so any feedback you have will be very uh, welcome. If you want to take a picture of that. And then the second one is the event feedback, which is also not optional. And I understand that there is some kind of unique prize if you get your name pulled out from the feedback uh, list. So. That is all I got. Thanks for coming.